Howdy folks! Nintendo was practically on top of the world back in the late 80s. Yes sir, Nintendo took the world by storm with their mighty NES console. The video games for that system, for the most part, were so good and sold so well that it would all inevitably lead to merchandise. Ah yes, merchandise. Where the real money from the games are made. There were Nintendo themed lunchboxes, t-shirts, toys, Hell, Nintendo even licensed their characters to cereal companies they were so popular. But probably the granddaddies of all this popularity had to be the Nintendo-based cartoons. The Big N was riding a huge wave of success during the 80s, so a few shows based on their IPs seemed like a natural choice. And of course, it was the Italian Plumber Brothers leading that little venture. The company that we have to thank for the Super Mario Bros. Super Show is the now unfortunately defunct Deke Entertainment. These guys actually might have been the correct team to be working on this cartoon. I mean, they made classics such as Inspector Gadget and the real Ghostbusters, so in a way, this was kind of another notch in their belt, at least as far as my opinion goes. Anyway, Andy Hayward, the lead animation producer and chairman at Deke, approached Nintendo with an offer to produce a show based on the Mario franchise. Nintendo were initially unsure of the idea, but eventually approved of it, and Mr. Hayward quickly put together a team. Two screenwriters by the names of Perry Martin and Phil Harnage were hired on as writers and storyboard artists. Deke had ordered 52 episodes to be made, so these gentlemen had a lot of work ahead of them. Also, whilst the concept of creating a video game-based cartoon was nothing new, it was hard to create and draw plots for it. Mr. Martin, in an interview, stated, quote, We were struggling to get a handle on the show. The core problem was obvious. There really isn't much of a plot in a Mario game, unquote. However, with some input by Nintendo, yes, they actually helped work on this, the storyboarding and writing was able to get done faster. During the production, two actors by the names of Lou Albano and Danny Wells were hired on to not only do the voices of Mario and Luigi, but also to play in the live-action segments. The actors worked on a six-day schedule where they would first film the live-action stuff and then drive to another studio in order to record voices for the animated parts. The Super Mario Bros. Super Show would premiere on September 4th, 1989 on CBS, and from there on, it became a ratings hit and eventually a cult classic. That is correct, Shasta. Depending on who you are, the Super Mario Bros. Super Show is either really funny and enjoyable, or really obnoxious and terrible. Well, let's take a look at it, and Shasta and I will give our opinions on it. The premise of the cartoon is like this. An episode begins with a live-action segment of Mario and Luigi interacting with another person, typically a celebrity. Then the animated segments begin. The plots for the show itself are pretty formulaic. Mario, Luigi, Toad, and Princess Peach would do battle against King Bowser and his evil forces throughout the many strange lands of the Mushroom Kingdom. After the cartoon segment finishes, the show follows up with uh, more live-action bits before the end credits roll. And that's how the show went. None of the plots really followed one another. It was a new story each and every time. In other words, this cartoon didn't really follow the plots of the video games, at least not too much, but where it lacked in plot development, it made up for was simply using a lot of elements, i.e. places and characters, from the games. In my opinion, that was a wise decision on Deke's end. As many of you folks know, Mario games, unless they happen to be an RPG, don't have much in the way of narrative. As with any TV show or movie, the characters are what drive everything. Mario is portrayed much like how you'd imagine him to be. He's the brave and adventurous go-getter leader that everyone loves and admires. Granted, he does have his fair share of dumbass moments. Luigi, on the other hand, is probably his brother's polar opposite. Unlike Mario, Luigi is more cautious and also a bit timid. I can't. I'm allergic to mountains. Yeah. 
Years before Luigi's Mansion hit shells, this cartoon was already showing Luigi as being a bit of a coward. Also joining the brothers is the pint-sized jerk ball himself, Toad. I can't say much about him, though, because he actually ends up being one of the more funnier characters for this cartoon. He does tend to wisecrack a lot more than the others, and his voice can get annoying, but hey, at least he's not completely useless like he is in the games. Yet another character who joins the adventure is Her Highness Princess Peach, and unlike her video game counterpart, she's not there just to get captured. At least, not all the time. She's just as integral to the team as the other three. I think it was pretty cool to see her fight Bowser alongside the others. Speaking of Bowser, he's here too, doing what you'd expect him to do. Deke did a good job writing these characters, and to me, that's pretty cool because they, at the time, were pretty much working with blank slates. They could have easily fucked these characters up. One of the things that I really like about this cartoon is how well it was animated. As I mentioned before, Deke were the guys responsible for Inspector Gadget and real Ghostbusters, and those shows were also really pretty to look at. The characters all look like they should, and they all have a wide range of expressions. Well, everyone except Bowser, that is. He tends to always have the same expression. But then there's the backgrounds and scenery, and I'm pretty sure the animators actually played the games because the backgrounds and stuff look like the levels from said games. I call that pretty good attention to detail. When a show like this actually captures that signature look from what it's based on, I can't help but commend it. In my opinion, that shows that the folks behind this show gave a damn. Another great aspect from this show is the live-action parts. As stated previously, the beginning and end of each episode had these live-action bits where Mario and Luigi would pretty much just do random-ass shit with a special guest. A lot of times, the special guest was a celebrity. Elvira made an appearance, and so did the wrestler, Sergeant Slaughter. To me, these live-action segments are hella entertaining and funny. Just take a look for yourselves. It's definitely random type humor, but I happen to personally like that. It wasn't just Albano and Wells having fun on that set either. A lot of the celebs that were brought on joined in on their antics. It should be known that a lot of the stuff that goes on in these live action bits were actually improv. This has led me to believe that Deke probably didn't script these parts, at least not fully. It's likely that they had a rough idea of what was going to go on in these live-action parts, but they ultimately let the actors just have fun with it. If that's the case, then that was pretty damn sweet. Kind of reminds me of old-school SNL, if only so slightly. Oh yeah, gotta mention that. As Shasta just brought up, the voice acting in this show is great, especially the work done by Albano and Wells. Now, if you're a younger Mario fan, then you're probably more familiar with Charles Martinet providing Mario's voice. But still, though, out of all the guys who portrayed Mario, and there's been a few, Lou Albano is the only other one besides Martinet who pulled off that character really well. True, Mario in this sounds more like a guy from NYC than he does an Italian immigrant, but still, I rather like it. Danny Wells did an excellent job as Luigi. It's weird, because prior to this show, Luigi really didn't have any kind of defining characteristics. It was here that he was given his own unique features, and Wells nailed it. Also, Luigi tends to be the funniest character. 
Huh? What'd you make that pizza with? And Colby's grapes and cheese whiz. I don't like that thumping sound. Boy, I wish Mario was around. Another actor I'd like to praise is Harvey Atkin as the voice of Bowser. Like Mario, there have actually been numerous people who've portrayed Bowser, but in my opinion, Atkin did it the best. He put a lot of effort into his role, and it shows. I also like the fact that he sounds like a mob boss. Then there's breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the rest of the week. <laughs> I don't know of many other things that Atkin played in, but I do know that he continued to do the voice of Bowser for the two other Mario cartoons, so that's pretty cool. The other characters sound good as well. Peach's incarnation here sounds more like a young adult rather than some old lady sucking on helium. And Toad? Believe it or not, he sounds very similar to how he sounds today. And yes, that can get irritating. But I give it a pass because Toad is pretty damn funny. With all the kudos I'm giving to this show, y'all are probably wondering, is there anything wrong with it? And to that I say, yes. Quite a few things. For instance, the intro and ending theme songs are kinda lame. Now, I personally don't think that they're that bad, but while they may not be awful, they are pretty dated. Take a look. Yo, yo, it's the Mario Brothers, and plumbing's the game. Found the secret warp zone while working on the drain. Lend the princess a hand. The ending theme isn't that much better. Do the Mario swing your arms from side to side. Come on, it's time to go. Do the Mario take. I just chalk it all up to be a product of its time. I mean, think about it like this. 1989 was the year the Beastie Boys released Paul's Boutique, so these tunes are probably quite appropriate. Whilst the cartoon had a lot of funny moments, uh, there wasn't one time where Italian food was not mentioned. Now, I get what the writers were going with. Mario and Luigi are Italian, so of course they gotta love them some Italian cuisine. But they really ran the gag into the ground. Don't believe me? Just watch. Spaghetti, the spaghetti sauce on pizza. Spaghetti and meatballs. Pasta. Pasta. Salami. Pasta. Pasta. Pepperoni. Spaghetti. Spaghetti. Pizza. And that was only from the first episode. Each and every scenario in the show has an Italian food joke in it. There is a reason why that is, though. As one writer, Perry Martin, put it, there were deadlines to meet, and they had a huge quota of episodes to fill. Many of the Italian food jokes that ended up in the cartoon got there because the writers were pretty much strapped for time. They just simply didn't have enough time to write in funnier gags. I can understand that. When you have deadlines involved, you sometimes have to cut corners for certain shit. Granted, the joke does get old fast, and the show suffers from it. Oh yeah, I almost forgot about those. In addition to the many, many mentions of Italian Grub, this cartoon just loves referencing pop culture. I kid you folks not, there is an entire episode that's a parody of Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior. It has Mario and the gang riding through the desert and rat rods. There's a refinery where these Wastelander toads live. There's even an epic chase scene at the end. It's actually pretty damn sweet. However, for every good pop culture reference, there's also a bad one. A good example would be this episode here, Star Koopa, which is a parody of Star Wars. Because, you know, that hasn't been done to death. I guess you could say that the pop culture referencing is hit or miss, but man, what it misses, it fucking shows. usually bought up when talking about this show is that it was more or less made to promote the Mario games. I can totally see where folks are coming from with that, and they may not be too far from the truth. In the book Game Over by David Sheff, there was an interview with Nintendo's then advertising and PR boss Bill White. In the interview, White pretty much said that the cartoon was made, quote, to boost awareness of the characters, unquote. 
However, I try to look past that because the show genuinely entertains me. I mean, sure, the underlying purpose of this cartoon was to help sell the Mario video games, but Deke put some effort into this, at least as much as they could. They could have easily fucked this up, too. This show could have ended up as bad as the Pac-Man cartoon from 1982. Yeah, we'll get to that one day. So, what are my final thoughts on the Super Mario Bros. Super Show? Well, objectively, it's actually quite shoddy. But despite that, I categorize it as so bad it's good. The cartoon definitely has its issues. They went overboard with all the Italian food gags. The intro and ending themes are quite dated. The pop culture referencing was hit or miss. And to top it off, the show can be considered a glorified commercial, to some extent. Though, for all its faults, I rather like it, and there's much to admire about this show. The animation is really good, the live-action bits are hilarious, and the voice work is top-notch. It may not be a great show based off a video game, but it is very amusing. Due to deadlines and time constraints, this cartoon didn't get to be as good as it could have been. But at least Deke put forward an honest-to-god attempt. And believe me, folks, I've seen some pretty shitty video game-based shows. Despite the fact that the Super Mario Bros. Super Show gets a B for bad, it falls squarely in the division of So Bad It's Good. In fact, I recommend you folks go and watch a few episodes. You can find the whole series for free here on YouTube at the channel Wild Brain Cartoon Superheroes. I'll leave a link in the description below. Okay, okay. What are your opinions on the show, Shasta? sharing your thoughts, Shas. Oh, we're not completely done here, folks. Along with the Super Mario Brothers Super Show, there were two other video game related cartoons that aired along with it. I'll catch you viewers in the next episode when we take a look at the Zelda cartoon. <laughs>